For the next couple of minutes, I'd like to talk about unleashing the power of Earth observations. You know, if we uh, look at the Earth from space, it's no doubt from looking at this particular image that you can see where uh, we as scientists have coined this, the blue marble or the blue planet. It looks like there's a tremendous amount of water on this planet. There are a couple other things you can see from this particular image of the Earth from space, though, is uh, there are no political boundaries. So although we see the continent of Australia here, you don't see it's in individual states or provinces, there are no political boundaries. You look at the clouds that are actually moving around in the Earth's atmosphere, and they do not respect any political boundaries that we have on the Earth. So I think one of the key messages that we'd like to get across in this presentation is that the Earth really does behave as an entire system. It doesn't often respect our own political boundaries. Now, when we look at what appears to be a tremendous amount of water on this uh, planet that we call Earth, um, it actually doesn't, is not as much water as one might appear. What we see from this particular slide is let's remove all the water from the Earth and put it into a sphere or a globe, and you see that sphere at this location. So all the water in and on the Earth, salt water and fresh water. If you look at the next smaller globe right there, it's just the fresh water in and on the Earth. So no salt water at all. And if we then key in a little bit farther and you look at the very smallest dot, that is only the water in and on the earth, that fresh water in and on the earth that is contained in lakes and rivers. Largely, that is the amount of water that we use to drink from, that we use to irrigate our crops from. And so again, while looking at this entire planet from space, it looks like there's a lot of water. It really is a very, very precious resource. Now, we can assess those resources with earth observations, but what are Earth observations? When we talk about Earth observations, we're talking about any of the measurements of the Earth that are taken from either satellites, from airborne sensors, from terrestrial or land-based sensors, or from marine or sea-based sensors. Governments around the world are putting a tremendous amount of money into the networks that take these Earth observations, into the, uh, into the satellites that are uh, on orbit in space, and yet we are sub-optimizing this investment because the data is often not released broadly and freely to the citizens of the world. So while most of the investments that go into this entire monitoring scheme are done at taxpayer expense, we are sub-optimizing this investment that's made because we are not releasing the data, and that's what we want to talk about today. So the organization that I now work for is the Group on Earth Observations, and what we are largely trying to do is bring all the assets from these space-based, airborne, terrestrial, or marine-based assets together to address this range of society's problems. And again, while we've had some wonderful experience down here with the weather domain, Money of the observations are collected domain by domain. The measurements that are just used for weather or just used for climate or just used for agriculture, how can we bring all of these observations together and apply them to each of these of which are society's major environmental problems? Now, let's drill in a little bit more to those space-based components. You see a couple things on this particular uh, slide. First of all, this outer ring of satellites that are 35,000 kilometers above the Earth are our traditional weather satellites. We call them geostationary satellites because they hover over a particular part of the Earth's surface. So at the same time the Earth is rotating, those satellites are circling the Earth at the same rate and are able to take pictures of the same spot on the Earth 
every 15 or 20 minutes. If you look a little bit closer to the Earth, at about 700 kilometers above the Earth, you'll see what we call the polar orbiting satellites. So these satellites go pole to pole around the Earth, and as the Earth is rotating inside their orbit, these satellites are able to take pictures of the entire globe. Now it may take eight days, 10 days, 16 days to come around to that same spot on the Earth. What you really want to do is take the advantage of these satellites that are taking very rapid pictures of the Earth, although much higher, with these satellites that are much closer to the Earth. Now let's go in even farther and look at one of the satellites that was in that A train of satellites. It's the Landsat satellite. And it is this satellite that I think sets the stage for the importance of broad open data sharing. The first Landsat satellite, there are now eight. The first Landsat satellite was launched in 1972. And the US sold data from that Landsat satellite for 36 years, from 1972 to 2008. For $500, a Landsat scene when the federal government operated the satellite, four or five thousand dollars a scene when the private sector operated Landsats 4 and Landsats 5 in the mid 80s. But it wasn't until 2008 that we were able to convince the US government that you are limiting the uptake of this satellite information because you are selling the data. And so what you will see is that in the best year of sales in 2001, only 53 scenes a day were purchased of Landsat data. As soon as the data policy changed in 2008, you can see a tremendous tra trajectory of the uptake of this information. More than two orders of magnitude, from 53 scenes a day to 5,700 scenes a day of Landsat data are now being distributed to the world at no cost to those users. So this is a wonderful story about the importance of broad open data, but what is the data being used for? Uh, let's look at Spain, and what you will see here uh, is a picture of uh, forest cover for the entire uh, peninsula. This is over about a 10-year period, and so clearly the forested areas are shown in green. You will see some red or pink areas that over that 10-year period show deforestation or loss of forests. You will also see some blue areas where there has been reforestation or an increase in the forested area. It took close to 657,000 Landsat scenes to create this entire mosaic, this entire picture. If we had had to purchase every single one of those Landsat scenes, as you would have before 2008, that would have cost on the order of $260 million just to tell this story. That would have been about a quarter of the cost of the entire satellite. No government, no country had enough money to be able to create a mosaic like this with purchasing Landsat data. So if you want to bring more transparency to the forestry practices, to the landscape of this beautiful peninsula, you've got to continue, we have got to continue to advocate for broad open data policies. Let's drill down a little bit uh, closer, a part uh, in the United States. This happens to be uh, Iowa, Waterloo, small town by the name of uh, Waterloo, Iowa in the United States. And what you will see is a, a data derived from Landsat data. It shows land cover and land use. So you will see crop types in uh, yellows, greens, and pinks. You will see urban development in blacks and grays. But look at this one square going back to 2000, 
all the way down to 2012 and look at how the pattern changes through time. So for decades, farmers, not only here in Iowa but around the world, use a crop rotation strategy so that it would be corn one year, soybeans the next, corn the next, soybeans, and alternating back and forth so that one crop can replenish the, replenish the nutrients that were depleted from the previous year's crop. So this crop rotation not only is good for farmers, it's good for the soil. But what you can see is that in 2005 and 2006, the rotation was interrupted. Rather than going corn, soybean, corn, soybean, it went corn. Corn, 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 corn. Finally, in 2012, you start to see soybeans come back into the rotation. Well, in 2005 and 2012, the United States passed some uh, ethanol uh, legislation so that they would encourage farmers to, in fact, grow corn for the production of ethanol, and that interrupted this rotation, which was actually better for the landscape to continue that rotation based on this. So the quick story from a slide like this is that who would have imagined that from 700 kilometers above the earth, you can actually visualize, visualize the effect of public policies on landscape change. Uh, let's look at one more example. This happens to be wheat from re wheat prices from 1960 uh, out to 2011. And while we had a relatively stable uh, uh, pricing situation in this decade of the 60s and 70s, what you can see since then is that there's been a tremendous uh, variety or uh, uh, distribution in the price of wheat, uh, oftentimes due to droughts in 2008 in Australia and the Ukraine 2010, uh, 2010 and 11 in droughts in Russia and the United States. So if you want to be able to create a more food secure world, somehow we have got to minimize the hoarding, the market forces that take over and bring more balanced, uh, transparent patterns to what is in fact happening to those crops. So, uh, so again, in uh, 2008, 2009, 2010, you'll see it was particularly egregious. This is a slide that just shows uh, major newspapers and magazines around the world uh, that talk about the sheer devastation that was caused by uh, the droughts uh, in uh, the U.S. and, uh, and Russia, largely for uh, wheat production. Um, it was at about that time that the G20 agricultural minister said, listen, let's bring the marketing people together. This happens to be the Agricultural Marketing Information System, or AMOS, with the Earth Observation people so that we can start looking at this entire system in a much more globally transparent way so that we can bring whatever resources we have to bear in hopefully stabilizing to the extent that we can we know that there are many forces that really do, in fact, call, uh, uh, contribute to wheat prices. But let's at least take advantage of Earth observations. We will not be able to do this unless we have broad open data policies from all the satellites and those terrestrial or ter terrestrial land-based sensors uh, that you saw on some of the previous slides. So. Open data is absolutely needed. It is broad open data policies are needed for global monitoring. The earth does not behave country by country. There are global processes at force and we must bring more transparency to those global processes. We must leverage the investments that are being made by all countries. The satellites on right now are costing uh, close to a billion dollars. And to have the citizens of this world have to pay on top of those billion dollar investments to just get access to the data is, uh, is a travesty. Citizens globally 
deserve more. You deserve more from the investments that your taxes are paying uh, to our governments. So it's not just you. It's this young farmer, this boy in Africa that needs to benefit from those Earth observation satellites, those airborne measurements, those terrestrial measurements, this, those marine measurements that are being made. And the only way to leverage all those investments for the citizens of this world is to continue to push our governments for broad open data policies for, from their sensors that are being launched in space or put in place on the Earth's surface. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.